Hello, everyone. I'm super excited to see all of you interested in scalability. So we will be talking about scaling Kubernetes networking to 1,000, 5,000, and 100,000 nodes. I'm Marcel Zemba. I'm, I work at Isovolent, and together with me, we have Dorda Lepcevic uh, from Google. So let's start with Cilium. What is Cilium? Probably most of you heard about Cilium, and most popular is Cilium CNI, which is a secure, scalable CNI plugin that you can use for Kubernetes. Um, but then, except for Cilium CNI, we also do have Hubble in case you are interested in uh, network observability. And last but not least, Tetragon. So Tetragon allows you to, um, to, to basically secure your container runtime with policies similar to network policies. And what the, all of these projects have in common is that they utilize eBPF. So short introduction into eBPF. Um, you can think of it as you can write small program that can be attached to different events within uh, Linux kernel. And what you can do with it is, for example, if you are interested in observability, you can export some of the information from the kernel to eBPF map. And then from user space, you can access that data. But it also works the other way around. Let's say that you want to implement um, service uh, load balancing in Kubernetes. What you can do is actually take service, take all the backends that are behind the service, write those IPs into eBPF map, and then have the eBPF program translate cluster IP into one of the backends. And it's one of the most important parts of eBPF is that it's way more efficient than other alternatives. So we'll be focusing today mostly on Cilium CNI. Short summary what Cilium CNI is. Um, first of all, efficient scalable Kubernetes CNI that also provides security, Kubernetes network policies, but also more advanced Cilium network policies. Um, as mentioned before, service load balancing. So if you are um, interested in kube proxy replacement, you can use Cilium to do the service load balancing instead of proxy, and last but not least, which we'll be covering later on, as well as multi-cluster, if you are interested in running multiple clusters and connectivity between different clusters, then you can utilize Cilium as well. Um, but let's start with even understanding what does the scalability even mean. So our title mentions 100,000 nodes, right? But the scalability is not just the number of nodes. It's way more than that. So when we are thinking about scalability of Kubernetes, there are so many more dimensions that we care about. Nodes is just one dimension that we care about, but also like how many pods do you have? How many network policies? How many services? Or how many backends those services have? And with that in mind, uh, we really need to think about all those dimensions when testing uh, networking and scalability of Kubernetes. But then again, okay, we, let's say we have some rough numbers, what we want to test in terms of scalability. Um, what we need to do is understand when our cluster is happy, but what does it mean? Well, we need to have some SLIs, SLOs. So I mentioned here like few SLIs and SLOs that we care about when scale testing, um, networking, and Kubernetes. Uh, one example is pod startup latency. Well, we, we care how much time it takes for your pod's connectivity to be up. Uh, similarly, for the node, we also care about network programming latency. So you can think of it as uh, how much time it takes for the backends behind services to be propagated across, across cluster. If you apply network policies, how much time it takes for those network policies to be applied. And last but not least, in-cluster network latency and throughput. These are just a few examples. There is way more than that, but those are kind of most, mostly related to the networking, and some of them we'll be covering later on as well. And with that in mind, um, stage is yours, Derda. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about network security on a large scale, uh, particularly how uh, workload security with Kubernetes network policies can scale up to 5,000 nodes and 200,000 pods on a single cluster. What I'm going to cover is uh, the target scale that we want to achieve, uh, how network policies are implemented, what challenges we overcame and how, the performance and metrics, and improvements in progress. Uh, 
So first, uh, as Marcel mentioned, there are uh, a number of scalability dimensions that we care about. And in this case, we want to be able to support up to 5,000 nodes, 200,000 pods, uh, 100 pod changes per second, up to 10,000 network policies, and 20 changes to network policies per second. Uh, first, we'll start a little bit about network policies. Uh, what they are, how they're used, and for them, an important detail is security identity. So security identity is generated from pod labels and namespace labels, and network policies select the, these pod labels and namespace labels, the same ones, and then later, pod-to-pod -pod communication is allowed only between pods that have selected identities. Uh, to illustrate how network policies are implemented, we can look first at the control plane, which is uh, done by Cilium agent, that is a daemon set that runs on every node. It watches some Kubernetes API resources, like the standard ones, pods, namespaces, and network policies, and Cilium custom resources that are derived from pods and namespaces, Cilium endpoints, and Cilium identities. And with all of these data, it can populate eBPF maps that are the, the first, first eBPF map that is per node, it is IP cache, and it maps uh, pod IPs to uh, identities, to the security identities that I've mentioned, and then we have eBPF policy maps that are per endpoint, so every pod has one, and it consists of which identities are allowed to communicate with this pod. And then there is the enforcement of policies. On the right side, we see the data plane when pod A is trying to communicate with pod B. Uh, and there is a network policy on the side of ingress of pod B uh, when the packet is coming in and the network policy enforcement system is triggered. It will try first to map the IP of the incoming pod uh, to an identity and it will manage to find it here in this case and then, after that, we will try to find uh, if this identity exists in the pod B's policy map. And if it does, it will allow traffic. And in this case, it does. Uh, if it didn't, it will just drop the traffic. So it will be dropped. So what was the bottleneck when we are trying to uh, scale network policies to 5,000 nodes and 100, uh, 200,000 pods with 100 pod changes per second? So the thing is that in order to program eBPF maps on every node, uh, every node needs to know about IP to pod security identity mapping for every pod. This means that if we are changing 100 pods per second, we'll have to send 500,000 events per second to all of the pods, one event. And uh, Kube API server on the most powerful machines uh, cannot handle that much. Uh, over 100,000 events per second are already uh, troublesome. So the safe limit in this case would be about 1,000 uh, 1, nodes for 100 pod changes per second. And uh, what did we do to overcome it is uh, implement batching Cilium endpoints. And this was inspired by Kubernetes endpoint slice. Uh, this is done in a way that we are trying to slice the entire pool of endpoints. In case of endpoint slices, uh, we are reducing the size of the endpoints object, the Kubernetes one. And here we are just uh, reducing the number of events by uh, batching the endpoints into a group of 50 for the slice. And uh, there is a, a graph on the right which illustrates how uh, the diagram that illustrates how it's done. Uh, so when pod is created, uh, we see uh, on the point one, there is Cilium CNI add, and at that point, Cilium endpoint is created uh, in the Cube API server by the Cilium agent. And the Cilium operator has the job to batch Cilium endpoints into slices. Uh, Cilium operator is a deployment that can run in the cluster, and it will see this Cilium endpoint creation, and it will batch it inside of a slice and also create, uh, post that update. And then uh, the point five is when all of the Cilium agents in the cluster receive this Cilium endpoint slice, and all of them will be able to update the IP cache map that I mentioned in the previous slide. So they will all know about uh, this new pod's 
IP to identity mapping. So why does this work? Why does it work that we are batching endpoints into slices? Uh, the main uh, issue is that uh, Kubernetes control plane uh, is heavily impacted by having too many uh, events. Uh, yeah, when we have 500,000 events per second that uh, Kube API server needs to handle, uh, the performance is dropping and in some cases the watches are being terminated and their troubles in the cluster entirely. Sending fewer large requests enables Kube API server to handle the 100 uh, pod changes per second. And the Cilium endpoint slice contains the minimum amount of data for Cilium endpoints. Having security identity only to be a size of 64-bit integer instead of a list of strings, which can be a lot, uh, significantly reduces the size of each endpoint. One slice contains 50 endpoints, and a full slice is on average five times smaller than 50 Cilium endpoints. What about performance? So as I said uh, already, we've uh, demonstrated that uh, the scale will grow from 1,000 nodes to 5,000 nodes with the same churn rate on the pods. And the, also the number of pods can increase because we have some limits on how many uh, pods per node can be. And in this case, we are in general uh, supporting 200,000 pods because we are recommending about 40 pods per node on this large scale. And another thing we can see that uh, Cilium endpoint slices updates are rate limited to 10 per second because still we can uh, overload the API server and we need to rate limit it. In this case, we are sending 10 times a lower number of uh, events. We used to send with Cilium endpoints up to 500,000, but now we are f sending 50,000. And also we can support up to 500 pod updates per second. In worst case scenario, when you would suddenly want to update uh, the security identities of all of the pods in your cluster, it would take up to 400 seconds in this case. So it's uh, a little bit less than seven minutes. Uh, okay, so now we are gonna look at which metrics we are using, which SLIs we are having to uh, look at the improvements that we made on the bottleneck, which is uh, to propagate Cilium endpoints to all of the pods all of the nodes and for them to see the IP to identity mapping. So Cilium endpoint propagation delay metric exists in the Cilium agent and represents in this case network policy enforcement latency because policy programming latency on each node takes very low time, which is less than five seconds after propagation of endpoints regardless of scale. And the diagram we see here is a four step process where the start time is Cilium endpoint creation and end time is Cilium endpoint received through Cilium endpoint slice. Uh, and that is the entire delay that Cilium endpoint propagation delay metric is showing. What are the other challenges that we are currently facing? So for network policies to work at a very large scale, it's possible that there will be too many Cilium identities and there are some limits there. Uh, so Cilium identity equals the identity of one security identity for pods. And in this case, uh, there is a hard limit of 65,000 security identities per cluster. This is just by design. But the bigger restriction is that we have a uh, per pod BPF policy map, which is 16,000 security identities for each uh, map. And there are ways to trigger, uh, that ways that can trigger this, that can make you uh, scale up to over 16,000 pods uh, is 16,000 security identities. And that is, for example, if you have uh, unique label sets for most of the pods or all of the pods. So even just having 16,000 pods can, uh, in some senses, break the cluster where there will be, the new pods will not be able to start because the eBPF policy maps will not be able to uh, be populated. And also there is another problem, identity duplication, which comes from uh, distributed management of Cilium identities where Cilium agents are trying to create identities for the same uh, unique label set at the same time and uh, they will create different ones and there will be duplication which, will, which, is, which is causing that there is even more security identities in the cluster. And one ongoing issue is the namespace label change because uh, security identities depend on uh, namespace labels. It happens so that if namespace labels are changed, all 
security identities for the pods in this uh, in the namespace that was changing labels will have to also change. So what are the improvements we are currently working on? The first one is centralized identity management. We are moving identity management to Cilium operator from Cilium agents. This resolves identity duplication, reduces pod startup latency, because Cilium identities are created on pod creation now instead of Cilium endpoint creation. Security improvement, Cilium agent loses permission to write to Cilium identities, no longer has a vulnerability there, and enables further, further improvements and optimizations. Uh, this will enable us to start uh, using security relevant labels uh, filter, even without restarting Cilium agents. So it means that we will greatly reduce the number of security identities. In uh, some cases, we are able to reduce them by, by, a, hundred, by a factor of 100. And uh, another thing is improving performance and reliab reliability depending on scale by adding dynamic Cilium endpoint slice update rate limiting. We want to try to also uh, rely on priority and fairness of, of Kubernetes, but for now we still need to have this rate limiting and dynamically scaling up and down, and, and down based on the number of, uh, based on the size of the cluster and the size of the master VMs, the uh, Kubernetes control play VMs is going to work. Uh, another thing is faster policy enforcement for uh, system critical pods. Uh, this is achieved by priority propagation of Cilium endpoint slices. Uh, then we have uh, a reduction in policy enforcement latency on a large scale, which is not something that we've been working on, but in Kube uh, API server, there is an optimization coming soon for processing events for many watchers in Kubernetes 129. And now I'll be bring it back to Marcel. Okay, thank you. So we heard quite a lot of, a lot of different problems that we have when having single cluster. And now the question becomes like, what else? What, what else can you do if you are facing some of those issues? So uh, I would like to talk about cluster mesh. So if you are interested into higher scale, what you might consider is actually using cluster mesh to connect multiple clusters. So what is the cluster mesh? Cluster mesh, in a nutshell, provides you with connectivity, pod-to-pod -pod connectivity between the clusters. And then on top of that, what you are getting is all the benefits of Cilium. So starting with network policy enforcement that works across clusters, but also uh, transparent service discovery, so you can easily share services between clusters. Um, and of, for, of course, for example, transparent encryption if you are interested in this topic. Um, so let's go through two different use cases to kind of show you what's possible with cluster mesh. Um, so one example is, let's say you have two clusters and you have backends deployed to both of them. And let's say that you misconfigured your, your backends in one of the clusters. So what Cilium can do and cluster mesh, it can actually redirect automatically um, those connections to other cluster in case of misconfiguration. So if you are interested in high availability, that might be option for you. Um, another case. Uh, let's say that you are managing um, vault service, like in this case. Um, instead of deploying it to all of the clusters that, that you manage, what you can do is have single cluster where you can manage this service and then just simply expose it to, to other clusters that can then later utilize this service. Um, so we were thinking about scalability of cluster mesh and uh, our first initial architecture was quite simple that we developed for it. Um, the idea was that agent and operator, they are just writing the data to K Kubernetes control plane, including Cilium nodes, identities, and endpoints. And then later on, what was happening is that the cluster mesh control plane was taking all of that data and writing it down to, to the etcd. And as you can see here, the etcd then later is exposed to other clusters. So agents in remote clusters are watching for all those changes in nodes, identities, endpoints in order to provide the connectivity between clusters. And with that initial architecture, uh, what we did, we did scale testing. So uh, similarly, what we were interested in was 
scale of 255 clusters, uh, 50,000 nodes, uh, around like 50 nodes per second of churn, um, endpoint propagation up to 100 uh, endpoints per second, and half million pods in total. So with that in mind, we prepared our test bed for, for testing, and we were interested how much time it takes for the data to be propagated across, across clusters. And what we saw with this initial architecture was that um, in the above uh, graph, you can see like what's the number of nodes. And as it is increasing, you can see more and more spikes uh, which basically mean that the data propagation between clusters was getting a little bit worse. But what's even more concerning is that at some point around like 35,000 nodes, 40,000 nodes in the whole cluster mesh, we actually started to see that the data was not propagated at all. So we were wondering like, okay, what, what was going on, right? So we took a look at the etcd metrics and what happened was that whenever we were scaling the number of nodes, we can see that the CPU usage was increasing and at some point it just skyrocketed to like 50 CPU cores. Uh, similarly, memory usage was increasing and uh, what we found out was that um, when we took a look at the number of watches that were opened to etcd, uh, there is this sudden drop. So, and it correlates strongly with, with the issue that we saw with data propagation between clusters. And so what it means is that at CD at this scale was really struggling and was unable to actually handle the data propagation. So we were thinking like, okay, so with that in mind, like what we can do, what we can do to actually improve the architecture of cluster mesh and make it reliable at high scale. Um, so one more thing, the bottleneck was, as I mentioned, um, those all the, that all the remote nodes were watching single, single poor etcd that was basically struggling with 50,000 nodes. So we introduced one more component into the cluster mesh. We call it KV store mesh. And the idea is that instead of having all of the nodes in the cluster mesh, mesh watch the etcd, we have another one in, in, in each cluster that replicates the data for, from other clusters. So what it means is that nodes within single cluster, they are only watching the etcd in the same cluster. Um, so going from 50,000 clients that we had previously in our architecture, we were able to reduce the number of clients to a couple of hundreds. And this is way more manageable and much easier for etcd to handle. That was our assumption, but we of course wanted to make scale tests and ensure that uh, our assumptions are correct. So we did exactly the same test. And what we saw was that uh, when we have like super high churn of nodes, as you can see here at the beginning, um, then the amount of data is quite high. So we were throttling actually the amount of data that was propagated across clusters. So you can see that at the beginning during the high node churn, um, there was delay around one second, but it was pretty stable. But then once the node churn decreased and we were adding nodes slower and slower, the data propagation delay was much lower in terms of like, maybe it was like tens of milliseconds. And then of course, like, you know, taking a um, look at our experience with previous architecture, we were wondering like, okay, so let's take a look at etcd again. And um, as we can see, like CPU usage of etcd was totally flat all the time. Similarly, memory usage was not a couple of gigabytes, by, but a couple hundreds of megabytes. Um, so our title actually mentioned 100,000 nodes. And you might ask, OK, so why I was showing only 50,000 nodes? So first improvement that we are um, looking for in the cluster mesh is that sometimes we see that our customers want to scale even beyond 250, uh, 55 clusters. So we are actually adding support for 511 clusters in the cluster mesh. Um, and then on top of that, there are some other improvements that I would like to talk about. So we are targeting around 100 um, endpoint propagation between clusters. We are also looking into increasing that so the latency of data propagation gets lower. And last but not least, we were also uh, looking into uh, reducing the initialization time of control plane for cluster mesh. You can think of it as like 
if you are doing the upgrade and you need to upgrade the cluster mesh uh, control plane, then basically it needs to synchronize quite a lot of data. So we are also taking a look into that to minimize the amount of time uh, that, that is required for, uh, for initialization of the cluster mesh. Um, so, yeah, thank you. That's, that's all. And please provide feedback. Uh, we will really appreciate it. And now we have time for questions. Hi, uh, I have a question about the class mesh. Uh, I believe. Class Sorry, mesh. could you? Ah, I have a question about class mesh. So I believe it's using annotation to set the CDM global service, and uh, the CDM agent sync the service from the uh, other clusters, mm -hmm. and then it check the service one by one to tell if it has an annotation or not. Uh, so my question is, why not just use the label? I mean, so, you can use the Sorry, label. Could, you, could you speak a bit louder? Oh, sorry. Please, yeah. uh, my question is, why not to use the label instead of annotation? Because if you use the label, you can just uh, get the uh, cinema service by filter, right? You don't need to check it one by one. Sorry, sorry, I didn't get it, sorry. <laughs> um, Wait, okay, maybe I will just jump here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it seems like the microphone here is, yeah. Yeah, my question is, the, um, I believe the, the class mesh. Yes. Yeah, annotation, right? Annotation. Yeah, the cinema global annotation. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but with that, it's like the cinema agent needed to check the service one by one mm -hmm. to tell if it has an annotation or not. Yeah. So why not use the label? Why not? Use the uh, label. If you use the label, you can just query the service with the label. Okay, so um, yeah, so, so I think the question was, um, so currently how the global services work in cluster mesh is that you need to annotate the service. Yeah. And then the service is um, propagated across cluster meshes. Yes. And the question was, if instead of that, we could do the filtering on the agent side, right? Kind of. Uh, I mean, you, if you use the label to tell yeah. it is uh, global service or not, you could query. Okay, so the question is like instead of like propagating all of the data, maybe the agents in the remote cluster could actually query the API server in the other cluster. So this kind of raises you know reliability issues, I think. And uh, one of the things like imagine then like having fifty thousand nodes talking to single Kubernetes API server. That would be even worse, as we saw with the single cluster issues, like. It could work potentially up to 5,000 nodes, but once you go beyond, beyond that, that scale, you cannot really rely on the Kubernetes control plane to propagate that data for you. Yeah. Uh, the question also was if could it be a kind of like lazy loading thing where like once you use the service, it could query the Kubernetes API? Yeah, but still the, the class mesh API server is still the uh, music server to get all the right? Hmm? Mm -hmm. It gets the, the old service from Kubernetes API server and put it in the TV store mesh, right? Mm -hmm. So at that time, it also gets all the services. I mean, including now. now uh, <laughs> Could it be all services instead of just the ones that are la labeled? Yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, like we could theoretically. So how it works right now is you need to actually annotate the service that you want to expose, and theoretically we could we could we could um, transfer all of the services, but that's not really efficient. And also from security perspective, like you want to limit amount of services that are exposed between clusters. So yeah. Okay. okay. Um, do we have other questions? Yeah, I have one. Um... When he talked about a uh, Cilium operator that he will uh, like do the identity allocation, is that already available in the 1.15 or? No, not yet, but it should be available in 1.15, yes. Okay, cool, thanks. Oh. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for the great presentation. And I have a question to Dorile. Uh, because uh, we are using GKE and they are using like a data plane person too. It's not as same as the Cilium. So 
Have you tested that kind of scalability? I mean, I, I'm just curious how many nodes we can scale up with the data plane version 2 instead of the Stilio. Yeah, so the data plane v2 on GK supports up to 5,000 nodes as long as you have a regional cluster. Because there are issues if you're a zonal cluster, you have only one uh, Kubernetes uh, control plane VM. So uh, again, it's related to scalability is not just the number of nodes. We are, supposed to, uh, we are supporting 5,000 nodes and 200,000 pods with exactly those limitations that I presented here and those tests were done on GK. So if you want to run network policies on GK powered by Cilium because data plane V2 uses Cilium. Okay, thanks. So from my understanding, it's same like a limit and same like a mechanism is uh, like a native Cilium. Yes. Uh, yes, exactly that I presented. Those are the limits for GK right now. Uh, it's a kind of related question, but like a data plane person too, they are not supporting like a Cilium policy. We need to use the network policy. Is that affect any issues? Yes, uh, that's a good question. I didn't mention that. Uh, the tests here were done for uh, Kubernetes network policies, so the standard objects and not the custom resources. Uh, some Cilium network policies are not affected and would work, but there are some cases where it doesn't work, and there are some of them that are already fixed, and uh, Data Plane V2 is looking to support also some other network policies, but it's still in progress. So it's mainly about using them on scale. In general, it's not supporting because uh, on GKE, we are resolving some of the network policy related uh, use cases with in, a, in an, another ways. So in some other ways, so that's, that's it. Yeah, good, great, thank you. Sorry, I just remembered a uh, follow-up question uh, for the Cilium operator. Um, is that gonna work with like KD store identity allocation mode? Because as far as I know, Slim operator is not connected to etcd. It's only like... No, it's not using KV store. It's using CRD. Yeah, it, I know. But so it's not going to work with uh, KV store mode. Uh, it can. It will. It will. We, we will probably. Like r right now, right now we don't have a clear path of it. It, it is going to be first with CRD. Okay. Uh, yeah, if there is, is, there is a need for it, we will, we will have it as well. Cool. Okay. Thanks a lot. My question's around um, identity. You had uh, something in your slide about 65,000 identity of what you could scale to. How does that correlate to CIDRs, right? If you're talking outside the cluster to a legacy environment like VMs or something where you can't rely on identity. Okay, so uh, you mean like uh, in terms of like cluster mesh, for example, right? Or cluster mesh or just a single? Um... Yeah, so, so this is basically kind of like per cluster limitation. Uh, so if you are using like cluster mesh, for example, then the limitation applies to each single cluster separately. So you have like you can have more identities than than that in cluster mesh, and um, does does sixty five thousand equal a CIDR limit? Like how yeah. many CIDRs could I put into like a BPF map or total identity? Yes, yeah, so I, I can answer. So uh, uh, one eBPF policy map can have only sixteen thousand entries. So you cannot specify more than different sixteen thousand CIDR ranges. So one CIDR range will equal to one local identity, but not the same as Cilium identity, which is global. Because every node uh, is programming CIDR ranges as identities locally and doesn't share with other. Everyone can do it on their own. They don't need to share this data. So you can still, the limit is 16,000 different CIDR ranges. Hmm. And what if I had to go over that? Would that be something that it's possible? Would it, it's, it's, it's possible to increase the map size. Uh, right now, why we are not uh, looking into that direction is because there is a significant memory increase because it's a fixed size. So every time you create a new pod, there is going to be a new policy map for it. And then it's a fixed size. Right now, 16,000 entries, there is some uh, amount of uh, memory that needs to be allocated. So it's possible. It's a trade-off. You, you can do it. We are looking into a direction where we are reducing the number of identities with, where it will just work and it will be as optimized as possible, meaning that you will not have to use per pod additional uh, memory on the node that will be just fixed. And even if you, because even if you are then not populating these maps, this uh, memory is still allocated and uh, not released. Yeah. Gotcha. Great talk. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you.